Hello, everyone. My name is Stephanie Boozer, and I am with CUGC HQ. I'm so happy to welcome you to today's Ask Me Anything webinar. It's our first in a three-part series. Um, today, we have IGEL, Liquidware, and Nutanix with us. And uh, briefly, I'm just going to go over a couple of housekeeping details before we get started. So uh, we are recording today's session, so you will get a link to that tomorrow. It's going to come directly from GoToWebinar, so be on the lookout for that. Also, I know a lot of you submitted questions um, as you registered, and that was awesome. We have a pile of questions for these guys today, and I'm really excited to get to those. Um, we will take as many of those as we can, but we also want you to submit questions in your question panel as you have them, so don't be shy, put those in. Um, finally, also fill out our survey. That link is going to come to you towards the end of the session. It's short, it's anonymous, and it's just for CUGC use only. So I'll be putting that in the chat for you at the end. All right. Um, who is looking after our questions for us today? We have Shane Kleinert. He is a CTP. And Shane, oh, I didn't put your uh, leader, your leader on here. I neglected to stick that on your slide. He's That's all right. No, I mean, you guys are beta testing with me today, so we'll, we'll uh, let it fly. No problem. <laughs> we'll He's also do. a dancer. I don't know if you've seen him at any of our Excel meetings. <laughs> you knew I was going to say put it. Put me on full <laughs> blast. Already got a question <laughs> coming in about the moves here. <laughs> So Shane's going to watch all those questions for us, and he's also going to facilitate all of our conversation today. So thank you, Shane, for being on. Awesome. Happy to be here. We also have from IGEL, we have Douglas Brown and Mike Barmondi. He, uh, both of these guys are excited about today. Um, I know you probably know them from other community events, so um, lots of knowledge coming to us from IGEL or Eagle, I believe I'm supposed to say. <laughs> uh, uh, and from Liquidware, we have Jason E. Smith and Jack Smith. And uh, we were joking around that these are the Smith boys from Liquidware. So um, I believe there's no relation, but you know, you never know. <laughs> not that we know of. <laughs> not that you know of. And last but not least is Jarian Gibson. He is with Nutanix. He is a CTP and he's also one of our local leaders in Kansas City. So welcome everyone. With that, I am going to, um, I'm going to turn off these slides and uh, should just see everyone's cameras, make sure those are all displaying and um, let's get going, Shane. <clears throat> all right, let's do this. So uh, we got tons of questions. We got about 900 people on the webinar. It is packed right now. And that's the funny thing about this, I guess. You guys really don't know how many people are on. I could say anything. Uh, but anyways, uh, so so happy to get started here. We got a ton of questions that came in. Um, so I, I think I think it'd be fun, uh, guys, to uh, to get started before we we got a lot of tech questions and uh, probably have a mixed audience. So I think it'd be fun to kind of get started uh, with. Oh, we actually just got a, a question came in live. Uh, is and this is probably one of the most important ones here. Is is Jarian in his shed quarters? Jarian, can you answer that real quick before we get started, please? I'm actually working from the, oh, by the way, hi, Jarian here from Nutanix. Um, um, I'm actually working from the house today. My wife and I have dueling uh, meetings today. So instead of being in my Fortress of Solitude and shed quarters, I'm at the house and we're trying to balance the kids. So, you have a she shed? Yeah, I wouldn't really call it a she shed. A he it's, shed. Uh, a he, uh, <laughs> it's more of my... My fortress of solitude, because I guess how I get away from the house and from the wife and the kids. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think that's what I'm gonna say. I think she took the shed over. She's probably hanging out there. Right now, it's the kids. <laughs> so cool. Uh, so the first question I think would be, uh, it's it's good to talk about right now. You know, with all the craziness going on, we don't want this to 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 uh, to take up all the time. Uh, you know, obviously, there's been a ton of conversation about about COVID, and I hope everyone's uh, doing safe. You know being safe as possible out there. Uh, but I think it, it'd be good to hear from everybody. Uh, just a quick story, a question came in from somebody. and said, can each of you share a recent success story, how your solutions enabled a positive outcome for your customers uh, post, post COVID-19? Obviously these were unplanned times for, for a lot of customers. So I guess uh, we'll, we'll go around the room here uh, and try to, I guess, keep it to uh, you know 30 seconds. Um, no one told me when this ended, so I guess we got to keep track on time. I'm just kidding. I said 45 <laughs> minutes. We got to rock and roll. So I guess 30 seconds. Let's go. I guess we'll start top left there with uh, with Mike. 
go ahead and uh, give a quick uh, intro to yourself and let's, uh, let's hear the recent story. Yeah, Mike Barmundi, um, iGel Business Development Manager focused on Amazon for iGel. I'm in Seattle, okay. Washington. Uh, it's It's been crazy times. I think first and foremost, everyone please stay safe. Um, this is this is unprecedented and you hear that word a lot, but it's kind of crazy. But no, I think from an iGel perspective, uh, what we've seen is 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 really more of an internal iGel all hands focus on anything that comes in, right? I mean, I think before you kind of stay in your swim lanes and you talk from a sales perspective and just supporting you guys is, you know, hey, a customer request comes in, sometimes it goes up the food chain. As it stands right now, it's kind of all hands. That structure's become very flat. And we're able to move very nimbly. As an example, we had a major healthcare provider in the West Coast here in the US who, uh, who had some work at home from initiatives in India. And we sent out about 2,000 of our small UD pocket devices. And there was, a, there was some firmware mismatches. And so our sales teams got together with social distancing, updated those, around 700 of them, and sent them back out. So just some kind of internal customer focused stuff has been huge and I, I, I can really appreciate that from an Agile perspective. Uh, totally. I guess uh, Jason, what, kind, what do you have there from? Yeah, thanks for having us on. Jason Smith from Liquidware. We had several, you know, if you if we look back at mid-March and then around, right around the 1st of April, we had several existing customers and new, net new um, prospects that were calling us asking how we could help because we saw burst scaling of Citrix environments right off to take advantage of the work from home environments and uh, uh, to, to provide a stable work from home environment. So an interesting one was a large cruise line out of Europe. And I won't say the name, but they immediately, even before they st stopped sending ships out to sea with passengers on it, sent a lot of their own employees to work from home and needed to scale up their Citrix environment to uh, 5,000 more users, so they leveraged uh, Profile Unity, uh, our UEM solution to run on their desktops, and they then, in the, in the uh, two days later, sent their employees to work from home, as many as could, and and had them log on to their Citrix session, so it was a seamless experience across. And the other one was uh, in the Washington, D.C. metro area, so I won't mention the customer name either, but you'll figure out who it is because they run the rail system. Uh, for the government there in Washington, D.C. in the bus system, and they already had uh, a thousand Citrix users, and they needed it to send 4,000 users to work from home uh, th throughout this. Of course, the, the, the train drivers and whatnot can't work from home, don't have that luxury, but all the support staff did. So within a week, we were able to transition and help them burst scale their Citrix environment, doing much the same thing, uh, UEM, seamless UEM from their physical desktops and laptops into a Citrix session, and they immediately recognized their profile, had access to their data, and they were off and running. So they were helping essential workers get to work, obviously, and we were glad to help them and many more. And many continue to uh, to come to us. They, the work from home strategies have, have differed, and more and more people seem to be wanting a, a good level playing field and something as solid as Citrix to provide uh, work from home so we're continuing to help organizations uh, that's great to hear and and we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna keep going around but it's interesting as you guys are talking I was kind of looking through the questions and there's a really good question about and we'll, we'll jump to that after this as we kind of go around but uh, around cross-platform collaboration and synergies between your companies and how you guys collaborate and, and things like that and I think it's a it's a good uh, it's a good question we'll, we'll follow up with after that so so Doug uh, you could sell, say, share a, a success story I think because obviously what you you kind of run the community and built a community from the ground up over at iGel uh, from, from nothing to over a thousand thousand users I mean community is huge in a, in a situation like this so you know what have you seen uh, with iGel and, and helping folks out there during this crazy time sure thanks Shane uh, my name is Doug Brown uh, I'm a long-standing Citrix guy so I was one of these folks in one day nowadays I get to sort of run this community and uh, before I, I, I move further I, I must thank Shane because when we first started the community at iGel we were sort of like you know how do we do this thing and Shane uh. kept emailing me saying you slack you slack you slack remember this <laughs> I I do that actually. Yes, we're up to I think thirty, almost almost four thousand members right now. That's so, insane, uh, man. What's even more, That's yeah. Awesome. What's even more fascinating is we have one hundred and twenty thousand messages posted. So uh, in a you know two year span, that's a um, huge amount. So within the community, we're definitely helping people that are you know not able to go to conferences. You know the you know all the benefits of the, of the community. Um, but at IGEL, what we're seeing, like Mike said, 
uh, we've seen a lot around uh, from work from home. You know, you have companies that were one day they're in the office and the next day they have, they need to leave the office. How can they do that extremely fast? You know, how they can how can they take these existing machines that might be you know never connected to the the net or to uh, you know the corporate wire or you want them on the corporate wire and get them on there immediately? So we've been able to leverage or a lot of companies have been able to leverage our UD Pocket, which if you're not familiar with the UD Pocket, it's a small little USB stick. Mike might have one sitting close that you can actually just plug into your computer and then boom, it boots into the iGel operating system and it connects into your back end. So we've been seeing our admins and I hear about it all the time within our community where these guys are sitting there getting these things ready. They just mail them out. The end user doesn't have to know anything more than how to boot. Uh, log in or, or you know turn the machine on, boot it on up, and boom, they're into the uh, into their corporate environment. So it's been really really busy for us uh, getting that solution out and helping people you know instantly trans transition into this sort of work from home uh, new world that we live in. Yeah, I know it's it's that's definitely interesting, and uh, I think. I think it's it's in, I know we were we had a little chat obviously before we we kicked this off we were talking about how how crazy things have have changed you know things is you know like you had mentioned Doug you know uh, you know different folks that you know whether it's HR or you you know folks are working from home and all of a sudden you know people you haven't even heard of in the company are starting to contact you and, and check it on you it's like well where was all this before you know and just just it, just in general conversation and you know thinking about uh, same thing with uh, with you know working from home, right? Uh, you know, it's uh, we've been talking about working from home for years as being in the you know end user computing space, and and everyone's like, yeah, no. Some folks saw it and saw the vision. Other folks were super old school, and I think this is just going to completely revolutionize companies going forward. And we're already seeing it. Big companies are are closing and realizing they can you know instead of paying for the brick and mortar, they can have people work from home and stuff. So it's really it's sort of a bittersweet type of deal. Right, yes. you definitely don't want what's happening. It's it's really sad, uh, in every way, shape, or form. On the other hand, you know, I've been doing Citrix work since the you know mid '90s, late uh, middle yeah mid '90s, and and now that we can look and say, hey, we were right. You know, you should have listened <laughs> to us. This is a better way to compute, right? It wasn't about uh, deploying an application. It was about all the benefits, right? Yeah. And uh, uh, for those that were on that bandwagon, you know, uh, um, it's an easy transition to work from home. And if not, well, you know, get on it and, and all the flexibility you get from Citrix. Yeah, no, for sure. And uh, with that said, Jarian, how, uh, how has Nutanix helped customers and, and scale out uh, in, this, in this crazy time? Yeah, so one of the things, uh, first of all, you know, um, hopefully everyone's staying safe and, and everyone's doing well, uh, given the, the current times. And one thing at Nutanix that we've seen with uh, customers that are running Citrix, whether they're existing customers or new customers, um, is being able to help them scale quickly for the additional capacity that they're needing as they're transitioning more people to work from home remotely or wherever that may be. So, um you know, one thing that we, we've done to kind of help customers is our fast track program, which has been able to get them from order to install uh, very quickly um, so they can meet those capacity needs. And so a lot of things have been, been coming through and it, it's pretty much kind of been an all hands on deck type to make sure um, that whether it's uh, on prem or using our cloud services is getting them up and running as quickly as possible. Yep, no, it uh, makes total sense. So I'm next in line here. I'm going to skip over myself. I don't want to take up any time. I could talk a lot and jump right over to uh, to Jack from Liquidware. How have you guys uh, helped? I know uh, Jason helped a little bit, but what about you specifically, you know, being out there on the front lines, a lot of these customers yeah, as well? Yeah, yeah. Um, we've helped in a couple different ways. Uh, Jason was talking a lot about the being able to onboard the users yeah. and get their settings and move. Uh, the other side effect is being able to notice what your users are doing because they may have been able to see what they were doing on a normal workload and now that the workload is a you know double tripled or pretty much gone to 100 percent um we are discovering a lot of interesting bottlenecks in you know proxy systems and vpn issues and compute problems and capacity issues that they never in a million years would think this is going to be a problem but now that yeah. you know they're at that near 100 percent capacity um it, it's actually quite interesting to, to to see how these companies are reacting um I, and i if you any of you caught any of our cucgs or cucgs i've spoke to in the past 
it's a lot of conversations of where do I scale up my compute? I might have on-prem, but I also need to have some sort of cloud backup, not necessarily for performance, but for the for the fact that they are professional data centers. They compute, they build, they grow almost instantly to fit your needs. And then when that contracts back down, hopefully it will, um, you return the rental. You don't buy the, you know, you don't necessarily have to buy the compute for the capacity. You already have it. You've already had it for a while, but this is a new territory and and having that ability to expand into somebody else's data center versus you having to just buy a bunch of hardware is important it's kind of that use case that's always talked about when when they talk about cloud you know it's like scale up scale down you know be elastic and and this is like that situation happened and there were just i mean we're we're consultants right we're out there working with all these customers and we were just it was like i mean probably, you know, four or five weeks of just nonstop working with, with some of our large customers, you know, through, yep. through the night with all kinds of stuff, scaling up and everyone is super important, right? So it's, it's been, uh, it was crazy. Uh, thankfully for us, and it has, has kind of dropped off a little bit and, and folks are, you know, getting back to, because everyone's onboarded now, right? So that's, yep. uh, that's great to, to see how those uh, tools have helped. And that's kind of one of the, the next questions, I think. And, and I think that was great to hear, hear those uh, success stories there for sure. Um, and it's, it, it's interesting because the next question that I want to bring up is, you know, how important is monitoring uh, and what level of monitoring is recommended? It, nothing to do with the situation, just in general, when you're talking about an end user computing stack. Um, so that's kind of uh, directed to anyone that wants to jump out there and take it um, and go. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> where. I, I could probably yeah. answer that one. I've got a good answer for that one. Um, <laughs> you don't know anything about monitoring, do you? You guys don't do monitoring, do you? Uh, uh, occasionally. You yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, monitoring, like I was saying about the success story, monitoring is vital to understanding your workloads and your user experience. That's that's key, right? And focusing on only high-level or hypervisor stats alone uh, it, it can show you the infrastructure, but you have no real insight into the actual trends and the experience of the users itself, right? So overall, uh, how the guest operating system, you know, is quote unquote feeling is more important to uh, how the hardware is working um, at the hypervisor level or again, in the remediation factors. And we I get asked a lot of a lot of questions around that is, well, do you have remediation? And I always sort of chuckle and go, there's two answers. Give it more hardware, reduce your consumption. It's always those two, <laughs> right? It, no matter if you've got a fancy PowerShell script, what is it doing? Probably reducing consumption or it's dynamically increasing the, you know, the, the, the resources that you're given, but those are always the same two answers, no matter how you skin it. So again, understanding what your users are doing helps you answer that question. Are they doing what they're supposed to be doing and we just need more capacity? Or are they doing what we did not intend for them to do, You know, like opening up 75 tabs of Google Chrome because they had their workstation at home and now you know, they have to share compute? Well, that's more of a cultural question. And if all you're doing is you're going, well, I can see that the Zer you know, the ZenApp server, Zen desktop is over maxing its memory. Let's just throw more memory at it. That might be a temporary band-aid, but it didn't answer why did that happen, right? So there's a lot of neat tools in the industry that are able to be reactive, where they can say, well, I can see on this workstation at this time right now and kill process. That's awesome. And those are very valuable. But if you are able to establish a trend of problematic issue over periods of time, now you can resolve the problem once and for all versus just kind of doing the quick Here's your answer. Thank you for calling help desk. Reboot your computer. Right. Don't call me until the problem happens again tomorrow. That, so. that final mile is, that Jack touched yeah. on was the, and now we don't know what all these work from home users are using at their endpoint. So we can put an agent on that endpoint and gather the metrics of the final mile. So monitoring the Citrix session is really good, but what about everything that's from that Citrix session and data center all the way down wherever that is, cloud or on-prem, all the way down to the local Comcast or whatever connection. And we can see that final mile. We can see it uh, with, uh, if you're if you're using a UD Pocket or, or iGel device as well. And you asked about some of the collaboration that we've done, so I'll touch on that too, yeah. is that we have a purpose-built uh, agent in there to be able to monitor the iGel devices. It's, it's in the iGel firmware. All you have to do is go in there, it's called Connector ID. 
and put in the address of your Stratosphere appliance, which is going to gather the metrics, and it starts reporting back like right away, and it'll start telling you that final mile of the UD pocket in the, in the device that the user's actually logged on to, because that end device and that end connection has become more important than ever out of this uh, out of the work from home initiative that's really exploded. Well, and that's a, a thing. I, I think it, it, it's shitty to say, but I mean, I think monitoring and digital has just been that last thought, right? That people think about. I mean, it's just it's always. They'll use, you know, what's built in, right? I'll use director, I'll use whatever is built in. And then you get you got kind of the ops, some some large enterprises have ops teams where they have all this, you know, fancy stuff. But but typically none of that focuses on the end user. So I think this is just another example of where where customers are really starting to see where monitoring makes sense. And 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 like you say, you don't know what you don't know. You know, as you put that that agent out there, you're you're finding all sorts of use right. cases that you didn't even think about. And and that whole conversation about VPN versus traditional, you know, end user computing type. Uh, access is just just brought right back up to the front, right. and right. there's just been a lot of that kind of conversation too. The other thing to add here is as well is also understanding the the impact of any change to the environment too. So not just yep. you know why I agree with everything being end to end. Also understanding if I patch this, if I add this application, if I add something new, what that impact of change is going to be to the yeah, environment and the performance. Out. And you you got to have a baseline, and then from there continue to understand what that baseline, how it changes mm -hmm. as you change things in the environment. Right. We're in the so, process of formally enabling all, all the Nutanix guys with uh, Jerry and on the line. I'll meet to that up more collaboration with Stratosphere, and they can use it in the field today. If if we don't have the the formal agreement, they can contact us. They know that, but they're using us as well. So more collaboration that we're working with them on. Well, no, that's yeah, that's one thing we, we, we've done with, uh, with with customers when they come in and say, you know, we kind of understand what our mm -hmm. environment's going to look like on Nutanix. So, and you've seen it as well, I use it for a sizing tool. So, run Stratosphere for a period of time, get that sample of data, and then take that and feed that into our, our sizer to help right size the environment for the customer. Right. Well, and to that yep, point, so, I mean, there's there was interesting really quick, there was three different questions that we saw. We, full disclosure, obviously, we're giving some questions beforehand so we could formulate some answers, but I noticed a trend personally on how do we do work from home, right? This this large scale concept of how do we do work from home, right? How do we how do we monitor it, right? As technical as how do we troubleshoot, you know, layer seven latency issues from someone's house, right? Funny, I was going to ask you about that. That was good. All right. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's so it's so relevant, up. right? Because yeah. I think it's IT pros. You guys have always had, especially Citrix people, control over some modicum of the environment, right? You you had to right you had to reach over the the cubicle to that network guy you're like oh god i hope he's in a good mood today right <laughs> so to hopefully maybe you know help you troubleshoot or figure out what's going on with the vpn and work from home just kind of blows so much of that control away right so end to end right to jarian and jack's point of saying from the device to the session right to the app or the data what visibility do i have that's it's even more critical in work from home to use all those tools in between right in between liquidware stratosphere um, Nutanix is kind of on-demand provisioning and the way that they can size things and and kind of make that jump right. If I in, in Nutanix, right? If I needed to go to a cloud and expand my my Citrix uh, footprint very quickly, I can. And then from an agile perspective, being able to provide an ecosystem where, to your point, right? You can't control updates now. You have people at home with devices that are like, to your point, Jarian, right? The baseline goes away potentially without a set environment end to end, and that just becomes super difficult. So. This this combination of Nutanix and Liquidware and iGel, and, and I mean, stroke and egos here, but these are some of my favorite people on the phone. It, it just it becomes very powerful to work from home for sure. A lot of stroking Ooh. going on on this call. That's right. Let's, uh, let's, 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 <laughs> let's, 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 uh, let's jump into some tech for a second here, and just I want to lightning fire some uh, some tech questions at you guys. Uh, just so I want to make sure some of those questions get answered, and we can jump back in. There's some fun ones as well. Uh, so we'll start out here. Um, uh, let's see. Let's start out with uh, just, and this is going to be a quick one. Is uh, iGel from a smart card support for SafeNet? Is there ability to uh, adjust, configure, or change this in the future? Is there yeah. support? SafeNet. Doug, yeah. you 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 know anything about that? Or I think Doug's just giving me the. I'm in a dark room and my den nod is the yeah, boss. Mike, Go for it. <laughs> Mike's the techie. I'm the community guy. So uh, all the the deep technical stuff is is Mike's to answer, and some of the roadmap questions and things of that nature I can address. Okay. You gotta search that uh, community channel for SafeNet keyword right now. <laughs> you know, that last response. There, right? <laughs> I would I would imagine is it's in there, but uh, you know I'm not that stupid. I brought my ringer, right? Uh, so, like, <laughs> great, like, great. My shoulders are getting massaged. I'm about to answer. So yeah, um, <laughs> essentially we have a we have an integration with SafeNet. Obviously, 
we enable the safe net piece, right? And then all those upstream changes, right? Adjust, change, configure, that's all done on the safe net side. So we have that integration kind of like stratosphere. And again, at the end of the day, IGIL OS is just kind of like, it's kind of like an empty payload on a space shuttle. Now I'm showing my age, right? It's basically, we, you can put whatever you want in it, right? And we have integrations from stuff. We'll take you to that spot and then we'll let you out and then we'll go back and get something else. This could be Citrix, it could be this, right? And, and this is what we do is we help integrate that stuff. So yeah, we can absolutely do that. All right, awesome. Yeah, we're just an operating system, right? We're a secure yeah. operating system on the endpoint. And, and the same with, with uh, SafeNet as, as with Liquid, Liquidware Stratosphere, right? You know, it's just a simple uh, configuration on the endpoint and in our back end. So, so, uh, so while you're talking about the UD, uh, the UD pocket, uh, is, Uh, so do you have any, it's, uh, this question is worded a little uh, out here. So en enhancements in UD Pocket and Thin Client, so do you have, do you have uh, anything to help customers enable accessing VDI remotely and securely? We kind of talked about that, I guess. Just just quickly spend uh, 10 sec 15 seconds talking about UD Pocket and how it can uh, benefit folks and what it provides. I'll answer that question. Uh, I'll take this one, Mike. I mean, the UD yeah. Pocket is just, you know, you, you have to understand what, I, what uh, IGEL has as an operating system with a management tool, right? It's a secure... Uh, highly uh, customized, customizable operating system that can be installed on basically any device. Either we install it on the device itself or we use something like this UD Pocket, which is a, just a USB stick that has the OS installed on it and you boot from that device. At that point, it contacts the, uh, our, our management component and then it pulls down the conf uh, configurations, you know, the, uh, the Citrix connections, you know, what have you, right? And off they go. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's very simple at IGEL. We have an operating system and we have a back end, right? The two communicate with each other. And like we mentioned, if there's a component like Liquidware, we just click some boxes, maybe put in some settings, everything goes down in any place, anywhere, anytime. It's uh, sort of the same, not the, not the back end. Yep. No, it makes uh, makes total sense. So thanks for covering that. Uh, so we'll we'll jump back to some more IGEL questions. We're gonna shift over, give everyone kind of fair share of time here. So Jarian, we got a question uh, around Nutanix. Uh, so uh, just how does uh, you know how is Nutanix beneficial to Citrix? Want to just give us the uh, the the one minute overview of of what you think your key points are as to why what sets Nutanix apart and how it can integrate better with Citrix. Yeah, so one of the things with that is uh, just our work with Citrix to get integrations to to run on top of Nutanix. Um, also be able to provide the same um, options for hypervisors that you have in virtual apps and desktops or the virtual apps and desktop service. Um, going from there, specifically um, MCS, you know, and there's always MCS scalability, performance, you know, how do I handle MCS at scale? And one of the things that we have in our, our architecture is shadow clones, you know, and data locality. Um, to get rid of some of those pain points with machine creation services um, and be able to scale. Other things built into our software stack is being able to have, you know, uh, disaster recovery orchestration built in, uh, replication, you have multiple clusters, multiple sites, um, things like files, so you can run um, your things like profiles, like Liquidware, um, and your uh, things you need for the persona right there on the same cluster workload built into the same management uh, control uh, base there. Uh, other things too to extend it out, things like Flow to help secure the workloads, and things like Com to automate um, the deployment and expansion of Citrix on Nutanix. So we can help with you know offering a complete solution to run the Citrix uh, software on our platform. Awesome, those are those are great points. Um, and I guess if there's any other questions around Nutanix, uh, while we're we're talking to Jarian, feel free to submit those. Uh, I will try to get them answered because I, I totally lost the uh, the broadcast button. So somewhere in one of my monitors is here. I'll try to find it. Oh, there it is. Uh, nope, no new questions. Uh, so the other question I have for you, Jarian, was uh, around uh, PowerShell module uh, for Acropolis, PowerShell core, any kind of modules or any additional enhancements happening there? So uh, today we, we do have our, our PowerShell command lines for, for AHP, for Nutanix today out there. Um, those uh, aren't... Uh, of course, PowerShell core or or as modules, but we do have some enhancements coming. So so stay tuned for some things coming to make our PowerShell integration better. Um, in the meantime, though, you can also use um, PowerShell with our REST APIs and get full functionality there as well. Um, while you're waiting for those official updates to those modules to come out. 
stay tuned from Jarian. All right, now sounds good, man. Appreciate that. Uh, so I want to hit a question here for Liquidware. Um, this is kind of a, one I get asked a lot from customers. So uh, you guys probably have this one queued up, ready to go. So um, how is Citrix? Uh, how does a uh, uh, profile or uh, Flex app uh, differentiate Flex itself app. from Citrix app? Yeah, but whatever it's called, you know that flexible stuff you guys do with applications. Yeah. How's it different than uh, than Citrix app layering? How do you guys set yourself apart? Do you want me to take this one, Jason? Well okay. equipped to go ahead. Yeah, I would think so. <laughs> um, so some of the major differences between those two technologies really is at the core of how the technologies themselves work, right? So with Citrix layering, everything is kind of related back to the uh, platform layer and, and OS layers. So everything is bound off of OS layer, platform layer, and then all layers that come off of that are all kind of tied back or the, the term uh, Unidus used back in the day was disk chaining. It's all disk chained back to the originating volume that created it so while that makes a very compatible and very um highly functional image compiler it, it doesn't necessarily lend itself to that last mile app right and what i mean by that last mile app is what is the major differences between one image in your environment in 15 probably about five applications Right. And those five applications are the ones that make your 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 pools a little more difficult to manage. Now, if all you're doing is compiling the image up and then pushing it out through PBS or MCS and you only have a standard, you know, two, three images, then then that's what you're going to be using. Right. It's very easy to do. But when you start to get into those variances, that's where we start to shine, where you might compile the base image with the Citrix layering technology. And then we take on that last mile of who are you? This is your app. Where are you? This is your app. What time of day is it? This is your app. And be able to assign those applications uh, to the users, to the machine on demand um, based on any contextual filters that we have within our systems. Uh, so we are not saying throw out what Citrix does. We're saying we work with what Citrix does. That's so an that's interesting point, uh, Jack. Jack's had a customer or a few that have actually used the two together. Yes. Yes. And, and focused on what? Patch updates and OS updates with Citrix app layering? And exactly. Yes. So that's what they like the part of the Citrix layering is we don't do OS management. That's not something we've ever wanted to do, which has a good and bad benefit. The, the bad benefit is obviously compatibility when you're doing image management, obviously is going to be a ton higher, right? Because you're compiling the entirety of the guest operating system. Um, but then you're bound back to the guest operating system that originated all of it. On the flip side, when you don't manage the guest operating system, now that layer that you created can go to any guest operating system. So I can start with a 2012 server and go to 19 with the same application. I can go from Windows 7, hopefully you're not on that anymore, but I can go from Windows 7 to 10 or different iterations of 10. I can go from 10 to 16 to 19 with the same application packages because we aren't tied back to the OS that created it. We're just putting those applications down into the operating system. Um, uh, kind of more or less to us, it's files and registry. And sometimes there's going to be some variances between server and desktop OS's drivers can occasionally be a problematic issue. But for the most part, if I can take that application and move that anywhere, now I'm back to my traditional state of, I built a new guest operating system for let's say 1909 this year. and then Next year, I might want to do 2004, whatever they're going to call it, 2012 at this point. God only knows when Microsoft is going to release Windows. Um, but I can move the applications without having to go through a whole entire repack procedure, or sure. I don't have to go through an in-place upgrade of the operating system. With, with Citrix layering, that can be tricky because if the upgrade goes south, you're done. You're starting over again. You've blue screened it. It's over. So you have that release valve of... I built out the OS, and then the apps are kind of separated from the whole conversation. Yep. And um, it, when you start yeah. to move in the cloud, that's a whole different story too. Yeah, well, yeah. I guess the, the 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 benefit of you know from a user environment management standpoint, when you extract all those things that are compact in the image, and you you basically you know decouple it, it makes it a lot easier to be flexible when you're moving your workload to the cloud and and, and whatnot. So it definitely makes that, a lot of sense. And I don't know if the if this is true or not, I've been trying to get this confirmed, but I don't believe Citrix layering is actually compatible in the cloud. Uh, well, it's no, it's. I mean, yes, well, it's the, it is. 
It is. It yes, is. It you, is. Can, okay. you can use it on Azure. I know that. Um, as far as, and they have connectors for Azure also. As far as the okay. other ones, I think you can move the image there. It's just the integrations are there. Yeah, you there. can definitely publish, okay. right? You can okay. use the, the layered image, right, and push the okay. DHD up there. I don't see why the Elastic Engine wouldn't work off like Azure Files or or NetApp Files uh, in I Azure. I think the Elastic but, Engine but, would, yeah. But again, yeah. even with the Elastic layering, that, so, yeah. everything is mm -hmm. still bound back to the OS, right? Because you go through the traditional package process, and at the very end, it goes, "Do you want to make it Elastic?" But you still yep. are kind of bound to the guest. So and, um, and, they, and they they have that feature of, of cross elastic layering in the in OS, but I think that's still a labs feature and it's not it's production yet. And it's yeah. Yeah, it's been for a while. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's been for about three years now. I see the lab feature and I just kind of just keep scrolling and just keep moving on to the next. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so I want to ask uh, Igel. So that was a great response. Uh, I do want to ask uh, Igel a couple of keys. Some of these questions are like quick responses, so I can just rapid fire match you. Uh, um, what does Igel stand for? No, I'm just kidding. That wasn't one of the questions. Uh, so mm -hmm. anywhere I'm getting Igel OS on Raspberry Pi. That's you, uh, I, I hear that like once a year, at, like recircles. You know, any, any developments on that, or is there even a use? Is there a value? Are you seeing like customer use cases where they want to use it? It's, if it's a roadmap item, you can't comment on it. We can just kind of do like yeah, a nod. It's a, it's a, it's a, we're, we're, we're definitely working on it. Uh, last year at Disrupt, our conference, we discussed uh, uh, supporting our, our operating system supports x86. The Pi is obviously an ARM-based operating system, yep. so we have to port our OS to there. You know, we need to look, you know, is there is this a viable uh, uh, platform for us moving forward to, to put all this expense? And then when you look at software development, you know, it's, is this feature more important than this feature, right? Uh, um, we have seen a lot of interest in it, which is really great. And it's definitely on the roadmap. Uh, with COVID, I think everything changes, right? So, yeah, uh, you know, where we see it this year? I don't, exactly. So, uh, will we see it this year? I don't know. You know, uh, but I, I personally feel, and I try to stay away from roadmaps, to be honest with you, because as a customer facing person, if you know it, you say it, right? We all know this. So, uh, um, but if, uh, um, you know, hopefully we'll see something sometime this year, if not maybe early next year. Mike, anything to add there? Yeah, I mean, ARM as an architecture in general is, is a focus for us for multiple reasons, right? There's cloud implications, yeah, you know, they're, they're you know, it's a, it's a huge focus for us. I think the, the challenge for us is really the ARM ecosystem is so diverse, especially when it comes to the kernel layer of the processor you're looking at, right? What it's supporting. Even Raspberry Pi to wrap your arms around the multiple iterations is tough, right? So, you know, how do we, you know, to Doug's point, how we handle those multiple pieces, right? But there's a lot of value in using ARM as a, you know, a low power uh, endpoint device. It's also inexpensive because obviously that can be super helpful for that from that perspective. So, yeah, we're definitely looking yeah. at it. It's definitely a challenge for us. We're just trying to get ahead of it. Yeah, okay, cool. Cool. For Pi is sort of an interesting thing because if you look at x86, you can write for x86 and have that work on any x86 platform. For ARM, it's not the way, that's not the case, right? The other thing is sort of the analogy I was given, which I really loved was if you're going to build a car, you don't build every piece. You buy the wheels from Goodyear, you know, you buy a steering, steering wheel from this piece, you buy an engine block here or what have you, right? It's really a supply chain thing. When you're writing an ARM operating system, not only can you not have that ARM operating system work on everything the way you basically could x86, but you're also going to build a lot of that yourself. So it's a lot more difficult than the average guy would imagine. And, and the more I'm told, the more I'm like, wow, that's quite interesting. Well, yeah, last, and, last, go ahead. Okay. But no, I was just gonna say when you when you look at all that effort, right? Then you go back to like, you know, what's the customer require? You know, what is the actual need? You know, is it just a small? Is it you know small educational environments? Because there there are tools out there that do that. You know, so I guess the question would be, yeah. where's the business proposition? Yeah. Makes sense. I mean, as not? an example, real quick, here's a this is a new um, vendor we're bringing online. It's about Pi size, but this is hardened for industrial environments. It only runs about 200 bucks. It's by a company called OnLogic. Right, and it has DisplayPort. It runs an Intel processor. This this one I have at home. It actually uh, um, is running IGEL OS on. It. I've been testing it, but it's it's a great example, right, of of a low uh, a low price similar form factor that's a little bit more enterprise friendly. So we're focusing on you know partner and vendor solutions as well. Yeah, no, it makes yeah, sense. The last, got, you know, mm -hmm. the last thing to say is really what we want is not the pie. We want casting, right, and workspace up. And I would love to see us do that. 
Yeah, that's a it's a great response. Uh, I do have just Mike, because you had mentioned Amazon and and kind of working on that. There was one question specifically around uh, from AWS perspective. So I think I'll just hit that with you real quick. Uh, do you plan to support remoting uh, protocols such as Nice DCV recently purchased by AWS? It's getting uh, is it uh, and it's getting traction lately. So. Oh, I love that question because that's a huge focus for me. So essentially, oh, it says submitted by Mike. Oh, you set me up, <laughs> yeah. man. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Home run. So Amazon's EUC offering basically has two core pieces. Yeah. One is workspaces, which is their dad's. The other one is AppStream. AppStream is kind of this one that focuses on streaming apps, and it has the nice DCV integration that allows the critical component, right? It allows USB device to be plugged in. Um, as it stands today, Amazon does not have a Linux client that has nice DCV built in. Um, it doesn't mean you can't like spin up a, you know, a Windows machine and EC2 and then install it there or whatever. But in terms of the clean integration, it's tough. We are currently in the back end working on promoting that for Amazon. And we have a couple of customer use cases that are requiring AppStream client, the full DCV piece uh, for these use cases. So we're currently in high level talks with them to bring that to market. Yep, no, that's, uh, that sounds good. I'm sure that person that submitted that uh... Hopefully it oh, was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, the guy got their answer. So I, I want to. And of jump course he's going to he's going to access his Amazon environment from his Citrix environment. I'm sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. That'd be Inception, right? You just hop from the different environments and just multi-layer the uh, protocols. From within yeah. Citrix. Yeah. Uh, so I do have a, a sizing. So there's there was three scenario-based questions. Uh, it's kind of like a Microsoft exam. Uh, they're about a paragraph each. Uh, so you get your notes, papers, uh, and whiteboard ready. Uh, so, well, I give this one's to Nutanix. Uh, so we have jarring on the line from Nutanix. Uh, what would be a basic guideline to follow when architecting a new Nutanix deployment for around 60 users, needing VDI server apps to be virtualized and running on Citrix? How many nodes for built-in redundancy and possible cloud backup for the environment? So without and you can't uh, say it depends. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. So without more details, I can't fully answer that question. What I recommend is so we have a tool generally, called, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what we do, we have a tool called Sizer, and what with Sizer we can do is we can put profiles in there, and within those profiles we can help kind of spit out a a sizing recommendation guideline as far as the number of nodes, the type of hardware, and and so forth. Um, but to further understand that, you know, because you have to understand, you know, vCPU to so CP ratios, the RAM, that kind of stuff. So one of our partners on the line, Liquidware, um, we can do, if you're an existing environment, do an assessment um, and at least get that data for seven days, take that data and feed that into our sizer um, to output you a, a right size of bill there. Um, so, you know, without more information, I can't really answer that question fully. Yeah, well, I think too, uh, to, to tie in that and talk more to like the synergies, you know, between everybody here, you can't see me, I'm going in between everybody on the screen, the synergy, uh, but you know, is is your, the Nutan or the uh, Liquidware sizer, right, that that has direct uh, Nutanix integration, uh, so you can capture that data and then use those APIs to uh, to help with uh, the sizing, right? I think that's that's a definitely a benefit um, that I've seen as a, as a consultant out there in the synergies between you guys. Uh, yep. Definitely helps get, get yeah, we, we, real this world data. Is available through so Nutanix can hook you up with that. Um, it's through uh, Stratosphere can help you do that, but also we have a partner network, so it's very likely your partner is also um, works with us. If yep. not, you can reach out to us directly, and we can get you some uh, licenses, or you can use our license under demo on our off our website, so you don't even have to engage. So just uh, let us know, or or just go download it and try it today, and it'll 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 gather at least seven days. Awesome. I do have a question. It's probably uh, it's pretty important. Um, what is it, it just uh, uh, just a, a quick answer? You don't have to go into the whole uh, you know the whole backstory. Uh, uh, what's your favorite uh, Netflix uh, series that you're hooked on right now? I've Let's got go a ahead. good one that I've been watching. So um, if you see me, I'm, I'm big in the Voltron and other stuff from the '80s. So they have a, a series called the the Toys That Made Us. And they kind of go into all the backstories of things like He-Man and G.I. Oh, Joe cool. and Transformers and Ninja Turtles. So you kind of see how those things came from start to being a product on the market, the, the TV series. So I, I find that interesting how all those things came out and the buildup going into those. I think there's like three seasons now of it, too, as well. Uh, that's pretty cool. I got one. Very nice. Yeah. My, uh, my favorite one right now, it's, it's an animated series on Netflix. It's newer. It's called The Midnight Gospel. 
So if you've liked, uh, if you liked Adventure Time, it's the same guy that did that. It is a complete and utter trip. So um, be prepared, right, to to have an existential slash philosophical crisis. But it's I highly recommend it. It's super cool. Um, yeah, the, the Midnight Gospel. It's awesome. So I just Netflix. binge watched that Afterlife. I thought that was funny. That was good. Mine's not Netflix, but it's YouTube. So I came across this guy. Um, you'll laugh because it's just way out there. Stobe the Hobo. This guy is a hobo. Well, he has a home base of Denver, but he rides cargo trains across the United States and part of Canada, and he records the whole thing illegal and whatnot. And um, he did this for a few years. Unfortunately, he passed away from uh, getting hit by an Amtrak train. Not funny, funny. But uh, this guy lived the life, a, a hobo's life, and documented it, and now he's bigger than ever now that he's passed away stove the hobo and it's some unbelievable artistic footage of the united states coast to coast city to city That's and it's, to uh, it yeah, is it's riveting true. the guy likes to drink a lot so if you don't like he's his, his goal is to get to the next town to show you the town and to find a place to buy beer but he's, yeah it's, it's well, it's, it's always cool to see the kind of that low budget type filming, you know. That's, he's he's an artistic type. guy. He's, yeah. To be appreciated, you have to watch a few episodes, but it's really riveting. Nice. It's really riveting. It is. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't uh, wait. I'm yeah, gets, the guy almost gets arrested yeah. several times. It's, uh, it's already uh, added to uh, to Doug's watch, so uh -huh. good there. <laughs> um, anyone else? Any, uh, is there any other one that or jump back into uh, uh, one more question that's unrelated to the, the technology, but I think an important question that was asked, kind of just just about knowledge uh, in, in, in general, and, and how um, how do you guys keep up? You you know keep up on the skills, keep up on the current technologies that are out there uh, with the fast kind of rapid pace that, that the industry is taking. Um, so I guess I just cut you up, Jack. Did you have any other Netflix stuff, or, or I was kind of jumping into the question there. Big you know, mouth, answers. big mouth, hands down. Animated big series. Mouth? Big mouth is amazing. Love the animated series. To dive into that. All right. It is Take so raunchy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We got hooked on Vikings right now, which I don't even think that's Netflix. That's Prime, actually. So I don't know. We've been stuck watching that. Watched it till like five o'clock this morning. Don't ask. Got problems. Uh, so, no to get back to your question, I'm the I'm the most marketing guy here out of the six of us, and so I I do try to stay as technical as I can. So I jump on. I try to jump on at least a couple of calls a week. I spoke to um, a private aviation manufacturer based out of Savannah this past week and we were running through all kinds of numbers uh, for you know they're trying to control costs as everyone is in these special times and we were going through you know their entire environment and what they're using so I, I love jumping on those also because we support Citrix uh, and any other scenario for Windows I like to get neck deep in every one of those and even when I before I was technical I would build my own PC and I hadn't done that in years but I do that, but I also, I was the guy that spun up iGel into a virtual box here at Liquidware and was one of the first ones to get it reporting back. So I, I try to stay deeper than possible because I get- it's getting a hands-on experience. I, well, I get dubbed as the marketing guy that doesn't know the tech. So um, I try. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that that Liquidware sign just pasted on the back of your wall there doesn't give that away. I don't know. But This is from a- <laughs> Is that part of your- uh, just Citrix Energy last year. Work. I cut up the booth. Yeah. And it was in Atlanta. So I drove it home to Alpharetta and nice. repurposed it. Yeah, you know, when you leave the booths, they, they cut them down and then they throw them in the garbage. They throw them away. The hobo steak and then sleep on them, you know? <laughs> Mm -hmm. it's so it's you crazy how much that, money right? goes into that and they just out of way because you put it's the year cool. on there they got to go digital with that stuff yeah oh god <laughs> oh, <laughs> I didn't want to keep it who on is my that pay. guy from his ted talk <laughs> that's awesome i think i remember seeing him at a cucg one time just put that on the wall right behind you that's good <laughs> it sits up there I, I put it on the ceiling when my wife sleeps sometimes and she wakes up and screams yeah yeah so, <laughs> I think I think uh, knowledge is one of the most interesting yeah. things, and we're all, we're all in community, and and I think that you know the community it's almost like uh, um, it's a, it's a, it's almost like I won't I don't want to say stupid question, but I think we all understand you know sharing of knowledge and, and things like that, right? I think the communities are the best place to go. You know, Twitter yeah, totally. is amazing for our industry, right? Uh, at IGEL, we have the IGEL community. Like I mentioned, you know, we have a hundred what 20,000 or yeah 125,000 messages posted 
all that is knowledge, right? Find the guys that you can chat with. You know, every one of us are willing to share information. And, uh, you know, if you're interested in the IGEL side, I mean, I have to say, join our community. Just join.igelcommunity.com. And, uh, you know, you, you'll absolutely love it. But, you know, if you're attending something like this, this is knowledge, right? That's how you, you stay up with it and listen to as many, you know, descending voices uh, as possible, right? Listen to liquid wires competitors and, and IGEL's competitors and Nutanix competitors and, you know, compare and contrast, right? And you'll find the, the, the best solutions. The more information you can get, the better. And then make up your own mind. It's great. YouTube is also and, phenomenal. You can learn yeah. anything up there. Yeah. And then for yeah, me to keep up on technology and stuff, it's just, you know, constantly testing stuff like, like we do internally is, is testing the software. Uh, as new versions come out, testing different solutions, see how they integrate. Um, like like Doug mentioned, the, the community, um, one community that I'm active in, and I, I know that Shane is as well, is World of EUC Slack, where we talk about anything and everything yeah, it's pretty um, awesome. under the sun there, and then just you know engaging with CUGC groups, because the local group here or the XL events, um, all good places to network and meet others in the community and reading blogs and you know just get a lab going and start playing with stuff, breaking it, fixing it, understand how it works. Yeah, we're uh, many kudos to World of EUC. Uh, within the IGEL community, we have a lot, a lot of members that are, are are members of your community, and and they they constantly say great things about it. Yeah, what if there's a way you can look and do like a cross platform. post, like you could have like a World of EUC inside of the IGEL, and then you we can just do, we can do it. You guys could do like a. Do you guys pay for it? Do you have a, a paid version of uh, a Slack? No, unfortunately, ours isn't. Um, since we're an uh, open source community, and, and Slack really doesn't support open source communities. So what we do is we kind of aggregate things. So for example, is a lot of people are on Slack, but we also mirror the entire Slack instance to Discord, and then we also pull in the Citrix IRC channel to both of them as well. Um, so yeah. we could potentially use that same integration to to pull in. Uh, some IGEL channels possibly, because um, I, I don't think with, with the free version that we can do share channels uh, across yeah. instances. Is yeah. that where you're going? Uh, yeah. Well, there yeah. are some, uh, yeah. some some uh, vendors on the phone. Maybe there's some sponsorship money will just uh, appear in your inbox. Uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, you but yeah, well, well, you could come chat with us. We'd love to love to have an integration between it. We just I I've, I've, I not that we have not had a discussion about that. So I love what you guys are doing. It's a phenomenal community. Yeah, one cool. thing we we'll probably no, do is, is look power, at the, so. the bridge we're using to do Discord and, and IRC, and possibly because we can also bridge with that uh, same uh, software we're using is bridge multiple Slacks too as well. So yeah. All right, cool. So you got five minutes left. Time flies when you're having fun. But we're gonna well lightning fire a couple questions I think could be answered really quickly, and then maybe so we'll do some closing thoughts there. So so real quick, uh, uh, UMS Web Console, yes or no for IGEL? Yes, yep. and it's coming soon. Coming. Beautiful. It's a good one. Uh, let's see here. Uh, it was a roadmap question. And so we talked about knowledge and community and uh, a lot of these questions, uh, a lot of the information, like, uh, you know, the, one of them was, you know, is there a, a partner in the Middle East, Egypt? And those are good questions, but a lot of stuff's out there, right? So we can, you can do, do a little bit of research and, you know, probably find some of these questions. Uh, so I think, I think we'll probably post these up somewhere. So we'll be able to, the guys will be able to answer them so we can hit them. Um, so, so we won't obviously can't get to all these. Um, so there, I do want to hit, cause I, I think the scenario ones are the most important, right? The question like yes, no type stuff, you can probably just find it in the docs, you know, but when you get questions like, you know, uh, like this, like for Citrix, uh, VDI or, or, or virtual desktops, right. Uh, or pool desktops, no apps, would you recommend appliance mode or standard IGEL, uh, desktop storefront configuration? Uh, it all depends, right? It does. Isn't that the correct consulting That's answer? It, it all depends. That. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it definitely does depend. I uh, take, you know, it, yeah, it is really, it's, you could answer that in so many different ways. But yeah, I think it depends. You have to and, have a uh, conversation with the customer. Sounds like a, yeah, it sounds like a blog post. Yeah. No, totally. Post that one in Must the end. Uh, yep. No, definitely, definitely. Um, uh, so, so I have one question here around um, uh, for for Nutanix. Uh, what tools do you uh, internally do you use internally to decide cluster density? Yeah. So uh, before I answer this question, one thing I just want to point out there is that mileage will vary. So based on your workload and That's and true. what the the footprint of the workload is, it will vary. But for us, we have uh, reference architecture guides out there, um, specifically anything Citrix on Nutanix. Um, and what we use internally is we use Log on VSI. 
um, along with MDT and some automation um, to do multiple runs of that. And that data gets uh, put into a centralized database. And from there, uh, we, we take that data and we, we make the reference architecture guides. Um, if you go view it, it, it tells you that we use a knowledge worker workload. Um, so two virtual CPU, four gig of RAM. It will tell you which Windows 10 version, the version of AOS, and all of our reference architecture guides are based on our hybrid models of nodes. So a, a mix of flash and spinning. Um, of course, we have users that use all flash, but uh, we find the majority um, have enough performance with our um, hybrid nodes, the way we architect our distributed storage fabric that they really don't need all flash nodes. But so yes, log on VSI, PowerShell, MDT, um, and then we, we pump that into a, a database. Sweet, uh, that, was a, that was a good answer. I just I just noticed there's a bunch of questions. I guess someone's been answering uh, good because I, I just my screen was like super small. There was a bunch of questions people have been submitting. So if we didn't get to any of these, uh, we will definitely get to them in some sort of post after. Um, can we integrate iGel? Uh, here's one right here. Uh, can we integrate iGel uh, if we're using Citrix Cloud? Our workload is on-prem, but the platform is in Citrix Cloud. Yes. Yeah. You can. Yeah, so. of course. <laughs> Yeah, We're it's, not just, uh, it's just not around. Yep, that's exactly it. So, um, all right. Well, with that, we have uh, we have two minutes left. Uh, do you guys have any any final thoughts? Um, or I can have, I can fire a couple. Uh, there's a couple short questions as well. Is there anything you want to add? Uh, anybody want to mention any comments or anything based on what we said? If not, I will continue. I have uh, two more questions I can ask here. Ask the questions. That'd be good. All right, boom, done. All right, so so uh, for Liquidware on uh, app layering, it just uh, do you guys just do desktops or do you publish apps as well? I actually posted a link in the in the chat window. Um, there there is we do both. We do both. So yeah. there's a way to do it through either you publish the applications to the server itself and then do the normal uh, publishing method that you do through storefront. Or there's an on-demand click to layer version where you just publish the on-demand uh, our executable and the path to the exe, and then it'll dynamically add the application onto the Zenapp server on the fly. And that's what that WebEx, or sorry, that YouTube uh, link is showing. Okay, perfect. Yep. All right. So, uh, so let iGel will UMS be cloud offered anytime soon? Uh, I, I saw that earlier. Basically, uh, the answer right now is yeah, you can you can actually install it in Amazon or Azure or even GCP. I actually have all my stuff running in, in AWS right now. Um, if you're talking more along the lines of like UMS as a service or some of our stuff as a service, we're looking at those things, but there's no there's no timeline for that yet. So if you want to, uh, we, let me know. Yeah, we need to make the UMS multi-tenant if we want to put it into a, a SaaS offering. Uh, we'll definitely get there. Right now we're a channel focused company. Uh, so, uh, you know, we really want our, our channel partners to do that. Uh, but if you want to put it in the cloud, you can definitely run it in the cloud yourself. But it's not an as a service model as of today. All right, so last question and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, this is for, for I just can't, I saw it here. Uh, it's, a, it's a good question uh, around uh, uh, iGel. Just uh, 100 UD pockets working from home. Uh, how, do they, how do they manage those? It's kind of cloud gateway, right? Uh, Anything you want to add there on that? Yeah. So quickly, those UD pockets basically, right? You can put into any x86 device. You can boot off it, so it's dual boot. Keep your original OS on there. At that point, to make things easy, no VPN needed. You can install our iGel Cloud Gateway, which is just a small appliance that lives in your cloud or in your data center. Next over one port, 8443, and then from there it communicates to the UMS. So super easy to manage. You can set up in a couple of hours. At that point, right, all your you know your session information. If you're using Citrix, it goes over those normal channels and ports and you should be good to go and we have best practices around uh the security and installation of that awesome well that's uh that's a wrap it's two o'clock uh or 201 uh, i keep going all day with this it's a lot of fun questions it's fun answering the questions but uh i'm sure people are probably reviewing this on their lunch hour they got to get back to uh to work although working from home what is lunch right we don't even know what date is anymore but uh, no, i know i think yeah i think so i have some Someone had uh, someone asked like a question on IOPS and um, you know how important is that today? And obviously with all the new enhancements with with with, uh, with solid state and all these different memory caching technologies, it was funny. I was looking at the question. I was like, wait a second. You know, it's uh, 
what uh what year are we in because you know we're in yeah, quarantine not, so long i have another question, discussion though. oh man it's crazy no, that it was uh it's definitely a good question because it does it, it it we're on prem maybe it's not it doesn't matter but it definitely yeah. mattered yeah. you're talking cloud right so it's yeah. a great question so uh, on prem that, on yeah. prem that, that's pretty much solved today especially on yeah. mechanics um it's very even with our, our hybrid uh nodes the main thing is getting your 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 um your solid state or your your cache tier size properly um, is there. So it's more of the capacity versus the actual IOPS. Um, just how we built in and the way we used our unified cache and our op log, how we can handle those bursts of, of, uh, of random uh, writes and then be able to stage those to, to disk. So with us using a combination of, of RAM, uh, solid state, and, and spinning uh, across those tiers, uh, IOPS isn't a problem even on our hybrid nodes. Good. So like, listen, we got trivia. I almost, uh, almost got booted, man. They're never gonna let me back. Uh, so trivia, <laughs> we got an Amazon gift card. Uh, so if first, first three people to answer this correctly will get uh, something. I think it's a, it looks like a t-shirt. Is that what they're getting there? So I have three t-shirts to give away today. And so yeah, the first, the first three to get the right answer, um, in, get a t-shirt. In the chat window. Yep, in the chat. Will, will you tell yet. us the answer? I will in I a minute. I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> Oh really? I, I wasn't right then. It's asked me this one. It's 2012, Doug. <laughs> All right, I got it. Okay, hold on. All right, so hold on. Let me get out of here. I, know, I know the answer, considering it's a it's an important anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> Jarian's good at math. So oh, it's hey, 20, right, look at that. Right. I guess right. <laughs> All right, so I've got shirts for like to write down these names really quickly because it disappears after I close the webinar. Uh, looks like Nazir, Marcus, Matthews, and Michael Kingston. Congratulations, guys. Congrats, guys. So since we uh, get to uh, Synergy this year for everyone to get out their shirts, we are handing them out in different ways. So uh, <laughs> this is one. Um, all right, and before you guys go, just a reminder, I know some of you guys opted in to uh, win one of $300 gift cards. So I am going to pull the attendee report when we get off this webinar and do a random drawing and I will notify, or I'll uh, notify who the winners, but we'll also announce it on Twitter. So make sure you follow us on Twitter to see who won. Um, also just come and check out mycgc.org if you haven't been around in a while. We've got lots of great blogs and more webinars coming up. Um, great stuff for you guys speaking to uh, community like they were talking about all of our CUGC to go meetings coming up. I put a link in the chat window to our events calendar so you can see what meetings are coming up next. Um, and also we'll be announcing our Excel events again soon. So stay tuned for information on that as well. And I think I am all done with everyone. So thanks so much for everyone attending. I want to thank all of our panelists today it was very educational and entertaining shane you did a great job of uh sorting through the questions and keeping it fun and lively and also cool. informative awesome. yeah it was a great great uh great panel so it makes it makes it easy so everyone extend your arms virtually yeah. <laughs> as close as you're going to get yeah. everyone stand up with iron oh. pants I'm just kidding. Like, <laughs> hands. like my dad and if you're wondering why you can't see me, GoToWebinar has a max of six cameras. So I uh, wanted all of my panelists to take up the screen. So thank you, Sounds guys. Like we got to upgrade to Thanks, Zoom. Uh, <laughs> thank you for putting yeah, this on. Yeah, thank you for having us. Uh, yeah, yeah, this was exciting. It was fun. Happy to do it again. Uh, yeah. yep, good to see you guys on here. Absolutely. All right. Everyone on here is awesome. And thank you guys on the phone for, for being with us. Be safe, please. Yep. Yeah, yeah thank be safe. you. Stay safe. Yeah. Take care. Thank all you. Right, take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 We say in Deutschland. <laughs>